Derek. Hey, Luke. How are you doing? Good, man. How's it going? I am, of course, with ModernHorrors.com. Thank you. Uh, I know it's relatively early where you are right now, so I appreciate you uh, getting up and having a chat with us. Oh, no worries. Thank you for showing interest in the film, and thank you again for the write-up. I really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to, to talking with you. Awesome, awesome. So, for those who have not seen the film, uh, you are, of course, you are, of course uh, the co-writer and director of You Are Not Alone, and I say in my review that you know, it's the scariest, by far, the scariest movie I've seen of uh, 2015. Um, but then I, I thought about that, and I can't really remember having that, like, sense of fear in recent memory, period. Um, so for those who haven't seen the film, what, what, can, what would be your overall elevator pitch or gist of the film? Well, um, you know, originally when we were uh, discussing the project and then uh, pitching it to potential investors and then ultimately the Kickstarter that we ran to finish it. Uh, the thing that we kept talking about was um, it's a literal first-person perspective thriller, uh, meaning that it is through the view of the main character and you experience what is essentially kind of a throwback to those original 70s and 80s slasher films. Um, granted, I think that that would be doing a little bit of a disservice to the movie because it is as if uh, one movie is completely derailed by another movie. And that is yeah. that, that first film is kind of just a slice of life, um, almost coming of age kind of story that is sort of aggressively... Uh, taken over by a more conventional slasher film. But for us, it was always pitching it as a unique experience in that it's a, a first-person perspective POV thriller. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, I can't stress enough how much I, I love it and how much the other guys on the team love it. Um, you mentioned that you ended up uh, trying to finish in out the film with a Kickstarter campaign or a crowdfunding campaign of some sort. What was sort of the journey of getting the film off the ground in the first place? Well, um, the idea of it sort of, it, it started several years ago, um, and I guess the, the actual origin of it was um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Rocky Yanakuros, um, had always had always joked around that you know the the most interesting thing that hadn't been done with the horror genre was seeing um, the film actually literally through the eyes of a character that was experiencing it, and that had always stuck with me. And then um, my writing partner, Chris O'Brien who I worked a little bit on with my first feature, um, Desolation Wilderness. He, he sort of uh, did a, a draft of that, that film with me. Um, we had been mulling over a bunch of different ideas for, for a couple of years, and we wrote a couple different scripts that never really saw the light of day. Um, and we just sort of came to this conclusion that we needed to do something that was that was small in scale, but really was at its core a genre film. And we had always sort of considered this idea of doing something in a single location or doing something that was, um, you know, the, the genesis of this idea was there is a woman alone in a house and something happens. And then we just sort of extrapolated it from that point on. And um, we wrote the film in a relatively short period of time. Uh, we were writing another film uh, when this opportunity came up. Um, and we started writing. 
I believe it was in January of 2012. And then we had the story and general script ready by the time that we were shooting in June. Um, so unlike a lot of other projects that we had started uh, before this one, where we had a ton of time to write, we were refining stuff uh, for a considerable amount of time, we were uh, taking an idea and running with it. And within just several months, we were in production of it. Yeah, so. that's awesome, man. You uh, you mentioned that it is it, it's very much like um, I mean, it feels very new age, you know. But at the same time, like you said, it's got that sort of seventies vibe, central location, small town, um, and that whole first part of the movie, you know, feels fantastic. Now, I take a look at the IMDb page of this one, and I know you got to take these things with a grain of salt, but. The reported budget on this thing is twenty grand, and I gotta say, if that's true, this thing looks and sounds absolutely phenomenal. Is that is that even ballpark accurate? Yeah, I mean, it, it it's funny. Uh, just for full disclaimer, um, now that we're we're actually this week um, at the the market in Cannes, um, and uh, I, I'm not sure entirely how budget numbers affects those kinds of things, but um, okay, but yeah, that's that's pretty much in the ballpark of what this film costs. I mean, there's a lot of other things um, that aren't necessarily tied to production costs um, that aren't really factored in, but that's that's definitely within the ballpark. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that this was always intended to be a micro-budget film, and it was something that, you know, a ton of favors were pulled in, and uh, a lot of the crew that had worked on it were really working on it because they believed in it rather than it was something that they were hired out to do. Um, and then when you were talking about the look of it and the sound of it, um, you know, that's, that's really directly tied to a handful of people that I think are really amazing that are right on the cusp of becoming a lot bigger. Um, one of them is our director of photography, Ryan Glover, who's a filmmaker in his own right. Um, he had just come off of a feature, and this is actually how we met originally. He had done a feature with um, the lead actress in You Are Not Alone, um, Krista uh, Zawashinsky. And we got in contact, and I think that his photography is phenomenal. He really brought a lot of the look of this film. And, um, and then the audio portion of it, was uh, a, a designer by the name of Jason Newman located out of Chicago. Um, we had met him right about a month in, uh, before we went into production, and Jason was amazing. I mean, there were months in post where he was almost single-handedly carrying this film, and I think a lot of his efforts really show and, and can be heard in the, in the final product. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that... The, the sound, I mean, it's, it's all fantastic, but the sound really drives it home. Um, so I, this one's kind of been on my radar for a while. I mean, you said you kind of started birth or inception around 2012. I, not quite that long, of course, but um, at least the better part of a year, I've been seeing this around bits and pieces or posters or stills or whatever. Um, I noticed that in some of the early posters and stills and things like that, the killer, I guess, for lack of a better term, has a mask on. Yes. And in my review, I actually thought it was so much better that he didn't, um, I, that he was just a normal person that made it so much more frightening. But then as I'm, I'm writing up the review, I'm getting some, some images together. I, I remember, I was like, oh yeah, did he have a mask on? So I go back and I, I watch it again and, and no, he doesn't. So what's, what's the story behind that? Well, um, you know, the, the interesting part of that was, uh, and, it, and it's strange because I don't know if this is something that people will, on multiple viewing, uh, viewings, see uh, for themselves, but um, he does for that, that introductory scene where there's, I, I don't want to give too much away or sure. any spoilers, but um, during that first house attack scene, he actually does have that mask on, and... Um, and when we see our protagonist uh, escaping, she's actually kicking it off of his face. Um, 
And then there's a little bit of context for why that mask exists earlier on in the film at the party scene. Um, yeah, I caught that. Yeah, we, we uh, are implying a lot that is shown off camera. Um, so the fact, the very fact that uh, the killer has this mask is implying that he's already met up with a few other um, citizens of this community. But, um, but again, it's, it's, it's so subtle and it's so in the background and it's not the focus that it did seem um, when we were doing at least the early artwork for the film a little disingenuous to promote it as if this thing is, is sort of exists. But then again, it's such a small detail in the overall scope of the film that, um, you know, when we were looking at and evaluating sort of our marketing materials, it just kind of felt right to use it, at least early on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't factor in a huge portion, but it's definitely there. Um, and I think it makes for just an interesting bit. But as you mentioned, um, you know, I, I think you're exactly right. I think seeing those facial expressions and and seeing kind of an, I don't know, just seeing an actor in that part rather than a guy or a stuntman or something who's just sort of faceless uh, yeah. was sort of important to at least making this feel like something different and maybe even giving it a little bit of a, a grounding um, in reality while still touching on some of those um, sort of uh, genre staples. You know, the killer has a mask, the killer has these sort of things that you identify with the genre, but not necessarily right. held down by them. And even in, you know, of course, like classic horror, you, you see that a lot, but even in home invasion movies, there's, you know, at least a ski mask or something like that. This, it just feels so much darker that this 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 man might not even worry about it. You know, like he's not even concerned. Sure. Uh, and, and again, um, I guess, uh, spoilers again, but he does sort of, uh, there, there's something more towards his character of having this, um, which Very, is touched yes. upon uh, with a later scene where he sort of creates a makeshift mask mm-hmm. that it's almost like a, a performance. And yeah. that, that was something to me that was interesting because, um, because I think it spoke to something a little bit more about this individual rather than, oh, it just looked cool or it was something that was neat to happen uh, in the scene despite how grotesque it was. Um, so yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. And, and I'm, I'm glad that, uh, of all things that that definitely came across. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and you mentioned, um, you know, the, the attacks and, and things like that, but this is shot in, in, in first person. So what were some of the challenges from a directorial standpoint? Uh, I mean, that, that's gotta be tough, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things, a lot of this film and even the production of it felt more experimental um, than I think initially we we realized. And, you know, a lot of, you see uh, specifically like the found footage films and you go, well, there are certain, uh, there are certain things inherent to the production of those kinds of films where you work around or you sort of finesse the story around those aspects. But with this, you know, we were just sort of finding it the entire time that we were shooting it and discovering what we could and couldn't get away with. And so much of our production was finding context for things visually and and giving the audience a real sense of geography. Um, You know, specifically talking about the attack scenes, I mean, those were things where I think half the shoot was dedicated to, you know, really figuring out the blocking and... Um, sort of approaching it, I guess, in more of a, a, what I associate with like action filmmaking, where you're spending so much time on the the very, very deliberate uh, stunts and and exactly where you're going to have to be, and and getting everybody on the production team and um, the on screen talent on the same page of making sure that these specific marks are hit and. Uh, you know, my 
previous experience in, in doing features and even doing commercials and um, other productions is that it's a little bit more free flowing. You know, it, you're, you're able to sort of discover things on set where this was, there was a lot of pre-planning involved and, um, and, and just making sure that things read appropriately, because like you said, you know, you've got this fixed perspective and there's just no coverage. And that was such a, such a strange thing that I don't know, um, how well that challenge is sort of read by, by an audience, but definitely the filmmaking community of just understanding, like there's nothing to go to. There is absolutely nothing to cut to. You are having to find everything within that frame and, and at the very least trying to match it later. Um, but there were a lot of really interesting opportunities that came from that too. And, you know, there was something to, uh, there was something to shooting that first portion of the film that isn't really a horror film um, in the first person perspective. And I just felt like those performances from everybody just sort of read like, yeah, they're talking to you. They're your friends. They're your family. Um, and, and I think that that helped sell not only the look of this film, but I think it, it definitely sold the story for when it turned, which was, you know, precisely the, the intent. Um, but with that said, I will say this, um, especially when you're dealing with a lot of uh, extras that aren't um, used to being extras on a film set, uh, people tend to look in camera and then I just thought, oh, well, this is the perfect <laughs> opportunity. We'll just have everybody be able to look into the camera. And strangely enough, no one wanted to do it. <laughs> everybody was well aware that they shouldn't do that. And it's like, no, look, she's a person. Right. Um, yeah. You need to look her in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, so far, I mean, everything that I've seen ha has been fairly positive uh, as far as, you know, reception. Um, is word of mouth good right now? I mean, I know our numbers at uh, Modern Horrors, I mean, it's, it's doing amazing. I mean, people are very, very interested in, in this one. Everyone's asking about release dates. And so, so thus far, the, the word is good. Yeah, I have to say that, you know, it was interesting. I think it, it was when it first became public when we were running the Kickstarter that I quickly realized that the first-person POV, um, just in that, that simple description, wasn't something that was reading to a lot of people. And it wasn't, I think people were really confused. And in fact, the, the first time that we were really presenting it to blogs in a marketing way, um, I was surprised at how many people weren't sort of picking up on that aspect of it. And I, I suppose it makes sense because it is of only a handful of films that have ever really done it, um, dating back to, I believe, uh, Lady in the Lake uh, from yeah. the 40s. Um, but, but beyond that and, and getting past that sort of obstacle, it, it's been really positive. We had... We had a screening of a, of a longer cut of the film that we did um, in the summer of 2013 with just like essentially the cast, uh, everybody who had helped out in the production in some way and, and sort of the local community and where we shot it. And it was really a positive experience and people were reacting and it was such a, an interesting experience to see it with an audience. Um, but this, the film has since changed from that point, we almost use it as a test audience, and um, we've we've sent out screeners. We've we've gotten um, a lot of good reviews so far, so that feels very positive. And like you mentioned, you know, there, there's a lot of interest in seeing it. And the one thing that I will say is, for anyone who's interested in seeing it, uh, you can help us get it out there by by showing that by you know publishing anything online, uh, by posting anything online, by sharing uh, the film's Facebook and, and Twitter and, and just liking it and following um, because distribution companies look for that sort of thing. They look to make sure that there's an interest in it. And, you know, the, the funny thing is that there has been such a seemingly high interest uh, in the film online that, you know, that that would bode well for us to finally getting it out to people. 
which has been the biggest challenge so far. So is, is this the film's first year at the market or, or not? Well, we, we, um, we did a screening of a longer cut um, last year. We actually uh, screened it uh, at, at Cannes. And then um, this, is our, this is our first year where we're just on the floor uh, with our sales company, um, DC Media's. Uh, for the first time, just trying to get it out and get it in front of people. Um, so we have a lot of hope. Uh, we're we're all very excited to see what comes from from the market this year. And um, word is uh, uh, very positive. So uh, fingers crossed. We will hopefully have some news within the next uh, month, month and a half, um, and hopefully getting it out to multiple territories. Yeah, I, I definitely hope so. I mean, I have a feeling once the right eyeballs get in front of that thing, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sell. Um, so every time we get like a really cool, fresh horror film, it seems like directors want to stretch their legs and leave the genre. Do you have any plans of sticking around in, in, in horror or, or are you, do you think, think you're going to mess around with something else next? Because like you said, this is pretty much two different, different movies. Both of them are very good. Um, one of them is not hard. So do you have any, aspir- well, I'm sure you have aspirations, but any immediate plans to uh, step outside that box? Well, I, I think that that's a, that's a really interesting question because, um, you, you know, this genre was really the, the thing that made me want to make movies in the first place. Um, I, I was about 15 or 16 when I had caught a Halloween marathon on AMC. And then I was just like sold. Like, I just want to be <laughs> a part of that. Um, and then in the years since, obviously, uh, sort of accumulated a, a varying degree or um, taste in, in films and the sorts of things that I'd want to do. Um, but it, it's interesting, both both features that I've done have been horror or at least horror-related uh, in some different way. And... And I, I would love to continue making, because I just think it's interesting. I think that, if nothing else, this wave that you're seeing, um, where it's almost like art house genre, um, mm-hmm. is really coming to fruition. I mean, you, you see it in films like It Follows being a huge success. You see it in um, you know some of the more known works like uh, Ty West's films. Um, yep. And that that I guess it was really the turn of mumblecore into genre, but I think there's a lot of interesting things that you can do within it, and I don't think that it's necessarily a genre that has been explored in that way uh, too much. So I definitely have a lot that I would love to do in the genre, um, and I think that uh, ultimately it's just what you have the opportunity to do as well. Um, Chris O'Brien and I are actually currently working on our follow-up to this, which is, uh, I guess the one way to describe it is just kind of bonkers. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's a weird, weird, it's uh, it's a slacker noir uh, with monsters. Nice. So that is, that is going to be uh, the thing that we're, going to get off the ground um, after you were not alone. Uh, so stay tuned for, for news regarding that, and um, hopefully we'll get some interest after you were not alone finally drops. Um, but yeah, to a long-winded response to that, that question would be, <laughs> I would definitely love to work within the genre. I think that there's a lot to do. I think there's a lot to say and, uh, and explore. So I'm, I'm definitely down. That's fantastic news, man. And uh, yeah, by all means, keep us uh, posted on the on the on the next film. I mean, yes, we, we got to have course. it. We're we're officially fans of yours now, so please well, I do. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. And uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Best of luck at the Can Market. I know that's very very important, uh, and we we wish you the best of luck. And, and thank you very much for taking uh, you know almost a half hour here to chat with us. It's much appreciated. Of course, I, I appreciate the opportun- opportunity, and um, I, I really do appreciate the the kind words uh, that Modern Horror has uh, has said about the film, and um, and I uh, hopefully will have some good news for you guys in the coming weeks. All right, man, fingers crossed for you. you have a great rest of your day, man. Okay. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye bye. No problem. Bye bye.
proof of it.